Hello and welcome to Forward Boldly. I'm your host, Christine Niles. Incorruptibles. These are one of the most fascinating aspects of the Catholic faith, and they are amazing. They're absolutely amazing, and there's nothing like them that exists anywhere else. I'm going to go into a recent discovery of what seems to be an incorruptible nun, and then I'm going to go into the entire um, sort of history, theology, and understanding of incorrupt saints. Absolutely amazing. No scientific explanation at all for these. But first, before we do so, I encourage all men to please attend our men's retreat this August. It is the Strength and Honor Conference, and it is specifically and exclusively for men of all ages, young and old, to get together and strengthen one another in the faith. Learn how to live your faith boldly in an authentically masculine, specifically male way. Speakers will be Michael Vore, Simon Rafe, and Jesse Romero, and it's always a great time of fellowship, it gives you a spiritual boost and a recharge so you can go out and share the faith with others, like I said, in an authentically masculine Catholic way. Just go to churchmilitant.com forward slash strength dash honor to sign up. All right, Incorruptibles. Recently, Church Militant published a story about Sister Wilhelmina. This has is a story that's kind of gone viral all over the internet, and it is uh, a discovery of the foundress of a religious order, the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, um, a, an order that is attached to the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, the FSSP, which exclusively offers the traditional liturgy. She left her order of 50 years to found this new order because of her great love and devotion to the traditional liturgy. And recently her body was exhumed because they had wanted to move her body from the graveyard into the church. And when they opened the coffin, they were amazed to find that her body had been remarkably preserved. What's even more ama amazing is that her habit, her habit, which was made of similar material to the lining of the coffin was perfectly preserved, even though the lining of the coffin had completely disintegrated. She passed away in 2019, and she was just exhumed um, here in 2023, and at the very end of April, I believe. And thus, four years in damp ground, she was not embalmed when she was buried. She was not placed in a vault. Um, she was simply buried in a simple wooden box. And after burial, the top of the box actually caved in, and so the dirt got in, and she was lying in a puddle of water. But remarkably, and at present, there is no scientific explanation to explain how it is that her body could have been preserved so well. The sisters say that when they picked her up to transport her body out of the casket onto the table, that she still weighed um, almost the weight that she had when she passed away. They said it must have been about 90 pounds. Uh, normally at that point, after four years, the body is just skeleton. So it should have been extremely light. You know, the skin would have been gone, would have been totally decomposed, leaving nothing but a light skeleton. Uh, instead, there's the body, still supple, still fleshly, and still bearing some, some weight. There's still some heaviness there. So this is something that people are still looking into, but uh, they have laid out her body and thousands, thousands of pilgrims have flocked to come see this extraordinary, what they're calling a miracle uh, of what they believe, who they believe is to be a saintly nun who may one day be canonized a saint. Very interesting too, that she was discovered this way now in this time when there's been such a crackdown on the traditional Latin mass all over the world in, in light of the Pope's Traditione Custodis, which is the decree restricting um, the traditional Latin mass. As many of you know, I, I love the traditional Latin mass. I discovered it about 20 years ago, and it was interesting walking into the parish. I was kind of new to the faith at the time. I'd been attending just a regular mass at a Franciscan parish. Wasn't entirely happy with uh, the liturgy because my love my love has always been the Holy Eucharist. That was the great draw to me, in addition to everything else about the Catholic faith and all the beautiful truths about the faith. The Eucharist was what drew my heart the most, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
called down onto Catholic altars everywhere at the words of the priest during the confection of the, of the Eucharist. Amazing, sacred mystery. Our Lord, there, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And thus, if you truly believe that, then you must treat our Lord with great reverence. And it pained my heart to see some of these priests treating our Lord with so much irreverence as if they did not believe that that were truly him. And when I attended my very first FSSP mass many, many years ago, I was thunderstruck. I was thunderstruck at just how reverent, how reverently the priest treated our Lord with so much reverence, so much love. And to me, that was an entire catechesis on the true presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. The priest didn't have to say a word. I simply looked at the way he treated our Lord with such great reverence, holiness, with the belief, it was clearly he believed, I am dealing with something deeply and profoundly sacred here. And that's a catechesis in and of itself, just as when priests are irreverent, also catechize in a negative way. They teach their flock that, no, this is not truly the real presence of God. Because if it really were, I would never treat God this way with such irreverence, such a carelessness as if I'm just passing out potato chips. And when a priest displays that sort of irreverence, well, then it really teaches the flock without him, his having to say a single word at all. It tells the flock, I don't really believe. This really isn't Christ. No wonder there's been such a loss of faith in the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. But that's a tangent. It's very interesting. I just, I mentioned it because a priest who was very excited about the discovery of Sister Wilhelmina's body found uh, this coincidence very interesting. Her love for the traditional Latin mass and the discovery of her incorruptible body at a time now when uh, dioceses all over the place are cracking down, I believe, unfortunately, on the traditional Latin mass. So many prayers for the church uh, in this time of difficulty and trial. So the topic of incorruptibles in general, the Catholic Church has a list, a long list of incorrupt saints in the church. I'm just going to rattle off a few names here that many of you may be familiar with. We've got St. Cecilia, who was found incorrupt hundreds of years after she was killed, St. Francis Xavier, Pope St. Pius V, St. John Vianney, St. Rita of Cascia, Blessed Mary of Agreda, who authored The Mystical City of God, amazing book, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John Bosco, St. Catherine Labore, and Blessed Carlo Ocutus, who is a more, much more recent um, saint in the church. But that's just a handful of incorrupt saints. And like I said, there's no scientific explanation to explain how it is that their bodies could remain so preserved. Now, some of the bodies are more preserved than others. I want to focus on St. Bernadette of Subirou. She, of course, is the French saint to whom Our Lady of Lourdes appeared. Of course, we have the healing waters of Lourdes, the healing baths of Lourdes. I myself have gone to those healing baths, and I have uh, brought back some of the healing waters of Lourdes. Many miracles, again, scientifically cannot be explained. Approximately 70 amazing cures that a panel of doctors and scientists cannot explain from people who used the Lord's water, the Lord's baths. But St. Bernadette Subirou is one of the incorrupt saints. She's actually called the Sleeping Saint of Nevers. Her body's on display in Nevers, France. And she lived as a very saintly nun. She passed at the age of 35 on April 16th, 1879. Her body was exhumed 30 years later. And the church was amazed to discover that she was just as supple and preserved as if she had just died that day. In fact, if you look at pictures of her taken on the day that she died and pictures taken today, she looks almost exactly the same. She looks like she's sleeping. That's why she called, she's called the sleeping saint. And this is actually very, very interesting because when they first exhumed her body, the church wanted a medical examination to determine the cause. Uh, they they wanted to rule out, um, you know, any, I guess, any human explanation. They simply wanted to find out how is it that she was preserved? Is there a scientific explanation for this? And so they hired a forensic scientist to take a look at her body. And just to ensure the public that the church was not trying to play a trick on the public, 
the church actually hired an atheist to conduct the forensic examination. He took down his notes, and um, these are some of his findings. He actually opened up her abdomen, and he noted that there was no odor coming from her body, no odor of decomposition, no bodily odors either that would be normally associated with just any human body. In fact, he says he smelled the scent of roses. Very interesting. Also, he examined her internal organs, no signs of decomposition. He also looked at her liver. Blood, fresh blood was dripping from her liver. He concluded that there was no scientific explanation for how this could be. Now, there is a wax mask over her face because her skin darkened a bit. This is very normal and typical of many incorrupt saints. The skin does tend to darken with the oxidization. The wax mask is simply there to protect. However, the wax does not preserve the body at all. And so critics, skeptics out there who say, oh, well, it's just a wax mask, big deal. You, you need to study up on the process of bodily decomposition because really she should be bones at this point. She's not bones. Part of her body, from what one of the doctors says, is partially mummified, but her skin remains almost entirely on her body. There are pat patches that are missing, but it's still there. And there is still no scientific explanation to determine how it is that she could remain as she is today. That's just one example. There's so many more. I encourage skeptics out there, go do some research on these. Do some research. Now, you might point out, oh, well, there have been other bodies that have been preserved through history. Yes, but they have scientific explanations behind them. For instance, you have bodies that were preserved maybe for about for many hundreds of years, perhaps a thousand years, uh, found in peat bogs in parts of England or Scotland. Well, it's because the peat, the peat is what preserved the, uh, the body. The, the peat is anaerobic. Um, it, it kind of, it's antibacterial. And so it kept the body from decomposing. What's interesting though, is when you took the bodies out, they began the natural process of decomposition. You can't make those same explanations applied to these incorrupt bodies. There is a book called The Incorruptibles by Joan Carol Cruz. It comes highly recommended by people and it goes into uh, many of these saints looking into uh, many of these cases. This comes to the uh, issue of relics, relics. As we know, the Catholic Church venerates and promotes the veneration of relics. Relics are simply parts of the bodies of saints. Now, why, why the veneration of relics? First of all, uh, it's, not, it's not blasphemy because we don't place, we don't worship them. We don't place them on the same level as God. God is God alone. No one else is his equal. We are mortal. So let's lay that to rest, first of all. Secondly, we believe there is a mysterious interplay between the soul and the body. What is the human person? The human person is a composite of matter, of body and soul, both together. The human person is not simply the soul or the spirit, nor is he simply the body. He's both. That's how God made us, soul and body. And as I've said many times before, one of the reasons that death is so agonizing is because the soul is being ripped from the body. It's unnatural for the soul to be separated from the body. They're supposed to be together. That's who we are, which is why at the resurrection, we will be united. Our souls will be united to our flesh. Our glorified bodies will consist not just of spirit, but also of flesh. Look at our Lord in his glorified state. After he, he met with the apostles, he ate. He ate fish with the apostles. Yet there was something mysterious about his glorified flesh because he was actually able to appear and disappear. He was able to walk through physical objects like a wall. So there, there's a mystery there about our glorified flesh, but it's still flesh. It's still flesh, but in a glorified state. It's not pure spirit. And the church has always taught that those saints who live holy lives, 
doing the will of God. The life of God lives in them. That is what grace is. It is the life of God in you, sanctifying you, purifying you, body and soul. It's not just your soul that's being purified. It's also your body. And when you die, that life, that sanctifying grace still remains. There's an attachment of grace to your body, to the flesh itself. And that flesh, that bone, that matter can impart grace to others, which is why relics have been known to miraculously cure people. People have touched certain relics and they've been cured. It's an amazing, um, remarkable thing that you find in the Catholic Church. You don't find it outside. You don't find it in the Protestant churches. They don't even have a concept of, of that. In fact, they completely disbelieve it. They object to it. I'm going to deal with those objections in just a moment because this is scriptural. It's absolutely scriptural. Before we get into that, though, I want to talk about the amazing power of relics uh, in the use of in exorcisms. I recently interviewed Father Carlos Martins. He's an exorcist, and he hosts, he's the producer of the hit series, The Exorcist Files. It has now surpassed 2 million downloads. It's very popular, and it's a wonderful catechetical tool to help people understand better the basics of the Catholic faith. It does not sensationalize exorcism, none of that. People have said that it doesn't because I've listened to every single episode. They're dramatic representations of his actual case files sprinkled with theology and catechesis to help people better understand the basics of the faith. I highly recommend that you go uh, listen to it. It's at exorcistfiles.tv. That's exorcistfiles.tv. But one case I found absolutely fascinating. It involved an exorcist friend of Father Martin's. And this exorcist was dealing with a a rather obstinate um, demon who had possessed an individual. And uh, the demon was manifesting, you know, during this exorcism session. And the exorcist asked the demon what his name was. As many people know who've studied exorcism, exorcists ask the demons what their names are, what their names are in order to uh, gain authority over that demon, which is why the demon will resist. He'll resist giving his name until he's so weakened that he is forced to give his name. In this case, the demon said his name was murder, indicating the grave sin for which he was primarily responsible, murder. The exorcist then asked him, who is your arch nemesis? Meaning, who is the saint who is your arch enemy? Why did he ask this? That's because it's been shown that if you have a relic of that particular saint, who is the arch enemy of this demon, uh, the exorcism is so much more effective. It's so much more powerful to eradicate the demonic from the afflicted person. And of course, this demon did not want to say who his arch nemesis was, but the uh, exorcist kept pressing him, ordering him in the name of Jesus, and the demon became weakened after the fight, after the battle and struggle, the spiritual struggle, which is which what is what exorcism is, that he spat out the name Thomas. And the exorcist was wondering, okay, is it Thomas Aquinas? Thomas the Apostle? Which Thomas? And the demon said, Beckett. And that was unexpected, Thomas Beckett. Thomas Beckett, of course, was the 12th century saint who died after King Henry II, who used to be his friend and then became his enemy, Um, essentially, he didn't order his knights to go murder him, but in a sense, he he made an offhand comment, who who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? So four knights went dashing off. They found St. Thomas of Becket, saying evening prayers. They came into the cathedral, uh, committed sacrilege, um, went right up to the altar and um, murdered him at, at the foot of the altar. It actually took four strokes of the sword to his head to finally kill him. And it was actually a very bloody and gruesome death because it was the final stroke of the sword that cut off the top of his head. Essentially, the tonsure cut off his skull and scattered his brains all over the floor. He died a very holy death. Before he died, he said he was willing to give his life 
to defend Christ for the sake of Christ. And he died, embracing his death deeply holy. And in the course of that exorcism, uh, the, the priest found out that this demon named Murder, and whose arch nemesis was St. Thomas Becket, actually possessed that knight who struck the death blow to St. Thomas Becket. It was the same demon who possessed that knight many, many, many centuries ago who struck that death blow to St. Thomas Becket. And because of St. Thomas Becket's very saintly and holy death resigned to God's will and willing to die for the sake of Christ, that St. Thomas Becket obtained great power over this demon in particular. Now he's a saint who reigns in heaven with great power. And so Father Carlos Martins, you know, they had a conversation. Father Carlos Martins had a relic of St. Thomas Becket. It was actually part of the blood-stained alb that he wore when he was murdered. He FedExed it to his exorcist friend at the next exorcism session as the demon is manifesting. The exorcist takes out the relic and he said that the demon uh, went absolutely insane, desperate to get away from this relic as he held it before his face, just lashing, kicking, all of that. Not because he was trying to hurt anyone, because he was so terrified and desperate to get away from this. And the demon was addressing the relic as if it was St. Thomas Becket himself standing there fully in his person commanding the demon, just staring at it, looking as if this, as if St. Thomas Becket appeared right before his eyes. And the exorcism went very quickly after that, and the demon was very quickly vanquished and gone. The absolutely fascinating account uh, of the use of relics during exorcisms and how powerful they are, it's absolutely amazing, it really is. But returning to some of the Protestant objections, as I said before, relics are scriptural. I want to give a few examples. In uh, 2 Kings 13, 20 through 21, so Elisha died, the great prophet, Elisha, some pronounce it Elisha, and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, lo, a marauding band was seen, and the man was cast into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. So all he had to do was touch the bones of Elisha, and this dead man was raised to life. That's a relic. That's a relic. Then you have the example of St. Paul, Acts 19, 11 through 12. And God did extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were carried away from the body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Handkerchiefs, aprons carried away from the... So all St. Paul had to do was he just had to touch a handkerchief. That's a second-class relic. He touches a handkerchief, imparts grace to that handkerchief, and then all they have to do is take the handkerchief away, touch it to the bodies of the sick, and the diseases left them, or people were even cured of demonic affliction. And that's right there in scripture. So Protestants cannot object and say, relics are not scriptural. It's right there. Other examples as well. I hope you're enjoying the show. The rest of the show is behind the paywall. So please go to churchmilton.com to watch the rest. For those who are not premium subscribers, you can sign up at churchmilton.com forward slash go premium. See you there.